mission of the Richland County Foundation is to improve and enhance the quality of life in Richland County through strategic philanthropy and community leadership. We do that through grants and scholarships, and scholarships are what I want to talk to you about tonight. We have college, career technical education, and aviation scholarships. Just to give you a brief overview, we give out about $500,000 a year in scholarships to over 250 students from over 60 scholarship funds. I have notes because I can't remember everything. <laughs> So our scholarship applications um, are all uh, online applications. We don't accept any paper applications anymore. And the scholarship window, uh, the application window for the college scholarships opens January 1st and closes on April 1st. And that's a pretty hard deadline. Um, we, we give you guys um, you know, several months to um, get those applications started. And you can start the application, save it, come back and work on it. So you don't have to do it all at one time. Um, and that's really helpful because there are some, um, some documentation that you will need to have uh, ready if you're gonna apply for one of our scholarships. Um, we do require that your student aid report, which is generated by FAFSA, um, is uh, attached to your application. We also want your most recent transcript, whether that be um, your high school transcript or for any of you who might have kids who are already out of college or out of high school, um, we would want their uh, most recent college transcript. Um, we also uh, need you to submit a permission to financial aid form to your college of choice. So that's actually really important when you uh, get to be a senior or if you have kids who um, are currently seniors or in college um, and you want them to apply for a scholarship for, from us, um, they have to submit a permission to financial aid form uh, so that the school knows that um, they can um, give out the uh, tuition package information that we need to determine eligibility. Um, our criteria are mainly that we're looking for students who um, demonstrate financial need, are Richland County residents or graduates of a Richland County high school, um, and there is a, a minimum GPA requirement of 2.5 for first-time applicants. I will also let you know that new this year, um, we are dropping our requirement for full-time enrollment, um, and that's due in part because of the College Credit Plus program. Um, we understand that a lot of kids are taking advantage of the CCP program um, and are going into college with uh, college coursework already under their belts, which is wonderful, um, but it also means that sometimes they are taking as many classes as they possibly can, um, and that wasn't considered full-time according to what our requirements were. And so we, we have dropped that requirement so that we're not penalizing anyone who might be um, going into school with CCP credits or maybe is a, a, a working student. We also have always had um, trade school scholarships, or at least for the last several years. This year we are calling those um, Career Technical Education Scholarships, or CTE scholarships. Um, and uh, the only requirements for CTE scholarships is basically that you're enrolled um, in a uh, a CTE program at a, an accredited institution um, and we have several of those um, in our area. North Central State College has certificate programs, Madison Adult Education, uh, Pioneer, Knox Technical Center, um, Ashland County West Homes are all considered accredited. Um, and so these are going to be programs that are um, not necessarily college bound um, but have uh, a lot of openings um, in the workforce and we've kind of adjusted at our CTE scholarships based on um, uh, some discussions that are coming um, based on the Ohio attainment goal of having 65% of Ohioans age 25 to 64 um, credentialed in some way post-secondary by 2025. Um, so there's a lot coming down the pipe 
with our um, CTE scholarships, um, including uh, um, added deadlines because of the different uh, start times for uh, these types of programs. Again, our scholarship applications are all online. Um, we don't mean for them to be daunting. We hope that they're as simple as possible, and we mean to be uh, a resource if, if at all possible. So um, if your student starts uh, an application process and has questions, don't hesitate to reach out. That's what we're there for. I will be over here um, throughout the rest of the presentation if you guys have any questions. Good evening, um, I'm Mrs. Escalera from Pioneer, one of the counselors there. And just from our standpoint, from the counselor viewpoint, CCP can kind of be complicated because there's so many different um, ways counselors handle CCP um, in their own school districts. So I just kind of wanted to go over it for our counselors of like the different criteria of what to look for, which you're going to hear a lot more in detail from the colleges and how they process everything. Um, but we wanted to make sure you guys are aware. So. You know, College Prep Plus is a great benefit for you to be able to take those college classes while you're in high school. We encourage you to do that. I know our superintendent, you know, is very, you know, encouraging about that. We usually have our students that come to Pioneer, you know, come from 14 plus different schools and it's kind of hard to know everybody that's coming to Pioneer or CCP. Um, but one of the criteria that the state and a lot of school districts follow is they have those letters of intent. That's really important to do for your local school district. Um, so you want to make sure you meet that deadline which I know they'll talk about that later on, um, but make sure you meet that deadline. Pioneer, if you're planning to come to Pioneer, we do not need a letter of intent. When you fill out your online forms, there's a section in there that says you allow your child to do CCP. And the reason we do that is because we have so many different students coming from different school districts. So for us, you do not need the letter of intent, but for other school districts, you do. Um, if you're from a private school, you're gonna wanna make sure you have your paperwork in for the private funding. Okay, um, books, again, each school district handles their books differently. So you wanna make sure you're talking to your school counselor about the books and how they handle it. Some schools are okay with you going to the college that you're attending and getting a voucher and buying it from the bookstore. Our school, we have you check it out from the library. You give us your schedule ahead of time. At Pioneer, we go and purchase the books and you check them out from the library at our school. Again, check with your school counselor on how they handle those school books. Because some, some won't, you know, like if you go on your own and you use a voucher, we won't pay for that. So we want to know ahead of time what books you're going to be using because we might have some stock, some already in stock. So why are we going to want to purchase another book? So make sure you're checking with your school counselor about the books. Um, also about, you know, credits. They say you're allowed 30 credits of high school or college credit a year, and you'll hear that later on. Make sure you're talking with your school counselor because that's in combination of your high school credits. So you want to make sure you're not going over those hours because if you do, you could be liable to pay the difference. You know, so you just want to make sure you're not getting charged with a big bill later on. Summer classes, if you're taking classes in the summer, that counts for the following school year. For example, if you're coming to Pioneer and you're a new junior into our school, we won't know that you're doing CCP. You have to let us know because otherwise we don't know that you need a book. So talk to your counselor at your partner school, you know, like on, you know, whatever school district you're at, if you're planning to come to Pioneer, because then we will be able to purchase your book and get your books to you. Um, AccuPlacer testing, some schools will offer the AccuPlacer testing, which they're gonna go over a little bit later on with you. That some schools do offer in their, in their school building, other schools do not. So again, talk to your school counselor to make sure to see if AccuPlacer is being offered there at your school. Um, a lot of colleges will accept the ACT, so you want to be able to have your ACT scores also maybe for placement. Scholarships at the college. It's important if you're thinking that you, you, know, you want to go on to that college and you want to use scholarships, you want to make sure that you have that all set up ahead of time your senior year. Because a lot of times, in, like for our programs at Pioneer, we have what's called articulation credit where students are earning college credit while they're in their labs and it's coming marked as a proficient grade. Well, that's great, but that's not a guarantee until your spring of your senior year. So I always tell our students, don't bank on that articulation. Make sure you have enough CCP hours to get a scholarship from like North Central State College for the tuition freedom, because it could change. So you want to make sure you're talking to your counselor about that. And then we, as counselors, do not make the final decision if you get enrolled into a college. It's the college. They're the ones that tell us that you've been placed into a class, if you've qualified or not. 
So if you want to know if you've qualified, it's the college that you need to get a hold of, and then you want to make sure your counselor has your schedule so they know that you're actually enrolled in that class and you're taking that class, okay? As Crystal said, my name is Scott George. I'm the Academic Advisor for College Credit Plus at North Central State, and I am ready to take you on the fun-filled journey that is CCP Info Night. Yay! Okay, so good news is we don't have 70 slides. The bad news is we have just under 70 slides, but they're going to go fast, I promise. The good news is every slideshow is available on the Ohio Higher Ed website, so in case you have to leave or whatever reason, the public, the non-public, and the homeschool information is available. This is kind of an amalgamation because we have students who are going to private schools and public schools, so let us begin. Let us begin. <laughs> always struggle with this. So what is College Credit Plus? College Credit Plus is Ohio's dual credit enrollment program. Students can earn high school credit and college credit at the same time. Students enroll in college courses and adhere to the requirements of college. So like Crystal said, the college ultimately makes the final decision about eligibility and acceptance. Uh, must complete an assessment exam and be determined eligible for College Credit Plus. So for North Central State, we use the ACT and we use the Accuplacer. Uh, different colleges have different tests that they use for acceptance. Be familiar with whatever school you're looking at and what assessments you have to take. Students can apply to any public or participating private college within the state. North Central State shares a campus with The Ohio State Mansfield, so if there is a calc class that you want to take there and a speech class you want to take there, as long as you are accepted into both institutions, you can take classes at both schools. The one catch is that you have to be an Ohio resident. Non Ohio residents are not eligible to participate, but if you're an Ohio resident, congratulations, you can be College Credit Plus. Students can choose from a variety of college level courses as determined by placement testing and course eligibility rules. Uh, credit can earn, uh, be earned to satisfy both high school and college requirements. So if you are going to be a junior and you come to North Central State and take English Composition 1 and English Composition 2, that actually takes the place of your English 11 and English 12 credit. Same thing with math, history, government, etc. You do have to complete the course for credit though. If you come and fail your history class, we can't give you history credits, kind of the same way it works in high school. I don't think anyone's surprised by that. Students may take classes during the summer, fall, and spring. So much like your academic year in May, when you finish up for the year, you are now officially the next grade up. So if you are currently a sophomore, will be a junior the second May hits. Um, as far as we're concerned, you have junior level status to take classes and can take classes in the summer. You can take classes at the high school, college campus, or online. Again, uh, you know, uh, Crystal talked about Pioneer. North Central does have a handful of classes available to be taken at the Career Center. So if you don't feel that your young scholar is ready to you know, venture off to college campus or that they may not be successful online, check with your counselor at your high school and there may be a college that offers classes for the student to take seated at the high school. Eligibility. Students must be eligible for college credit plus participation based on assessment exam scores. Again, each college has their own standards, but the, college, the state of Ohio also has um, a testing table students must hit to be eligible. Uh, so students must show that they are college level in at least one subject area on an exam such as ACT, SAT, Accuplacer, etc. Each college university may have different exam requirements. Uh, colleges review the student's scores using statewide standards. If the student's scores are not college level, other conditions may be considered depending on the exam scores. Overall GPA 3.0 or recommendation. So the state has a what we call a green column. If you hit one of those scores, you're eligible. They also have a yellow column, which is a conditional range of scores. All that information is on the Ohio Higher Ed website. Uh, I'm, most of the colleges here I believe also probably have it on there. But basically one green, we're good. If we have a yellow and a 3.0 GPA or get a letter of recommendation from the school, you are conditionally eligible to participate in College Credit Plus. College admissions. Students must apply for admission to each college that they want to participate. Uh, so again, if you wanted to come to uh, Ashland and North Central State and Ohio State, apply to all of them. If you're accepted, you can take classes. That's kind of how it works. Um, but again, each college has their own determinations about who is acceptable or who is eligible uh, and who can be accepted. 
Course registration. If the student is considered eligible and has been admitted to the college, then the college will discuss course options with the student based on assessment scores, prerequisites, and other requirements. You will notice going through all these slides, the state likes to be wordy. I will try to keep it concise. So basically, if you want to take a class in North Central State on our campus or online, you come meet with me. Simple enough? Yes? Okay. Courses can satisfy high school graduation requirements. Again, we talked about that. You'll work with your counselor. Oh, I still need a third unit of foreign language to be all eligible for the honors diploma. If the college has that third year, you can use that in place of taking Spanish three or German three, et cetera. Um, some high schools have more requirements for graduation than the state minimum, so always be sure to work with your counselor. The colleges here will help you as much as we can, but the most important person in your and your young scholar's academic life is the high school counselor. College advisors uh, help you know which courses to take based on assessment scores, prereqs, eligibility tests. If we don't do well at math, obviously we're not going to start in a math class. That's our job as advisors to make sure that you get into the courses you're eligible to take and that you need to take. Students must complete their first 15 credits in level one courses, which include transferable courses, courses in IT, computer science, anatomy, physiology, foreign language, courses that are part of a technical certificate, courses that are part of a 15 or 30 hour credit pathway, courses in study skills, academic, or career success. Until your young scholar earns 15 or more college credit plus hours total through all the institutions they're attending, they're limited to the list they can take. Every college has their list of level one courses on their website. Once a student completes the first 15, they are open to move on to level two courses and beyond as long as they meet the additional prerequisites for that class. Courses that students cannot take, private applied courses with one-on-one -on -one instruction, courses with high fees, study abroad courses, physical education courses, pass fail graded courses, remedial courses, or religious courses. So again, as an advisor, it is my job to tell you what you can and cannot take. University of Dayton has an aviation class that has like a $13,000 course fee. Students, we love you. You cannot take a $13,000 airplane class. No, it cannot happen. Grades, college credit plus grades earned in the college show up on your transcript as well. So if you come to a college, you get an A in English, you get an A on your high school transcript as well. Conversely, if you come fail a class at the college, you will get a failing grade on your transcript. Um, they're also going to be factored into your GPA as well. So if you are riding a high GPA, chasing an honors diploma, valedictorian, whatever, and you come and fail a class or get a D, that is going to wreck your high school GPA, just so that you're aware. If high school uses a weighted grading scale or advanced placement, international baccalaureate honors courses, college credit plus courses will be weighed. So if your college or if your high school does AP English and you come take college composition uh, at the college and you get an A, that is now a 5.8. A. That's how we get the GPA up above four, make ourselves eligible for scholarships, all that fun stuff. Students may take college credit plus courses in subject area, again, <laughs> The state thinks this is very important. I don't know if you guys knew this or not. Courses you take can be applied to high school graduation requirements. Uh, students must work with the school counselors to ensure they are meeting any mandatory testing or other high school graduation requirements. We as college employees are not responsible for whether or not you graduate. The only person who can do that is your high school counselor. I feel like we're just circling back and forth here. Okay, so this is a quick break off. For my public school students, this applies only to non-public school students and homeschool students. This talks about the process for them. Um, you must apply for college credit plus funding every single year. It's creating a safe account through the state website. The state website does have all of the instructions on there. You apply, you get a certain number of hours. You can take up to those hours without having to pay out of pocket. Public school students, we'll go into the calculations a bit later, but for non-public and homeschool students, you get what the state gives you. If you want to pay out of pocket, that is absolutely up to you. We don't encourage it because it defeats the purpose of College Credit Plus. But if you are trying to get certain classes done and the state doesn't give you hours, that always is an option for you. So again, step one is creating an Ohio ID account. Um, there is the website. Again, if you are a non-public or a homeschool student, go to the Ohio Higher Ed website, information for non-public and homeschool families, and it'll walk you through that process. Uh, once the parent has the ID account, follow the directions for requesting access for the funding application. Previous years, um, you would turn a paper letter of intent form into your counselor. That is no longer process. You will now do the letter of intent form that Ms. Escalera talked about uh, as part of your application process to receive funding. 
submit the application. Um, you do everything by April 1st. There are no exceptions. The state is not leaning on this whatsoever. By April 1st, you must have all the required documentation per the Ohio ID account application on file. Then in a couple weeks later, uh, you will receive confirmation as to how many hours you did receive. I just want to let you know that if you are a freshman, there's a possibility that you may not get as many hours. The state varies on how they distribute it, but just understand, have to have everything on file by April 1st. And if you're given something for a freshman that's not nearly enough, you can always pay out of pocket. Get the award letter, follow the instructions to get the letter, send the letter to the college. If you're attending multiple colleges, every college has to have that letter. If you choose to register for courses before funding is finalized and the student's not awarded, uh, the family will have to pay or the student has to drop the courses. So again, our summer term uh, starts in May. Hopefully the, the information should be out by then, but if you are starting at a college that has an earlier start and you don't have the funding letter in hand yet, please understand that you will be charged or we have to drop. Application process will begin in February 2020 for the year by April 1st. So if you are a non-public or homeschool student, please in your phone right now or on a piece of paper write April 1st, 5 p.m. The state is not kidding. That is the deadline. OhioHigherEd.org slash CCP has all the information that we talked about. Students and families, key information for non-public homeschool families walks you through the entire thing. They have a really handy guide with links available. Now back to the overall College Credit Plus thing. For public school students, you don't have to apply for funding. You are given 30 units a year. This is a complicated mathematical formula that I'm not going to make you do. Basically, there are 30 units in a box. Whatever you're taking at your high school is multiplied by three, and we take it out of that box. Whatever's left in that box, that is what you are allowed for the academic year, summer, fall, and spring for College Credit Plus. So make sure you work with your counselor so that you're staying under that 30 hours because we don't want you charged for those classes. Overall, through the 30 units a year, 120 total for the life of College Credit Plus is what you are able to receive. If a student enrolls in more, you have the choice to either drop the course pay for the entire course. The state doesn't charge by the hour, so that if you take 31 hours, they're not gonna charge you one hour over. Whatever class you took puts you over that 30 hours, you get charged for the whole thing. Lab fees, course fees, tuition fees, book fees, all of it. So again, your counselor is the most important person. They will work with you to make sure that you stay under the 30 hours. Tests, differences between high school and college. In high school, tests are sometimes given weekly or at the end of the chapter. College tests are generally fewer in number and cover more material and are usually worth more points. So you may have a weekly or a bi-weekly test in high school that's worth a small amount of points, where in college you may have three tests the entire term that may make up 30% of your grade. Study time. For high school, required homework ranges between one to three hours per day. For college, the standard rule of two to three hours of homework for every hour spent in class, three to five hours per day. Again, this is a general rule. If you are strong in math and taking a math class, you may not need as much time. However, if you are a poor writer taking an English class or a class that involves a lot of papers, it may take you more time. So two to three hours for every hour in your class, that's a pretty safe rule. Check that against your academics calendar, calendar at the high school, your extracurriculars, jobs, make sure that you have enough time to be able to participate. Knowledge acquisition in high school. You go to class, you get taught stuff, you go home, you do homework on the stuff, and then you come back the next day. College is not like that. In college, you read stuff, then you show up at class, and then you talk about the stuff, and then you have to go forward, and it's kind of backwards, but it's a lot of self-paced education in terms, or not self-paced, uh, self-driven education in terms of you are required to do the reading, you are required to do the workbook homework, you're required to do everything, and be prepared when you show up to class. Grades. Uh, lots of grades for uh, high school, quizzes, tests, homework, blah, blah, blah. In college, it doesn't necessarily work that way. We have had classes that are worth 100 points total with a couple quizzes and a couple tests. And if you miss one of those quizzes, your grade is just shot because there's not enough points left to make it up. So understand that the grading is different. It's not like high school. You can't show up five minutes before the class and write a paper. It doesn't work that way. Differences. Parents, we love you and we fully support everything that you're doing, coming here tonight and working with your middle schoolers and high schoolers. However, in high school, you get to be a strong advocate working directly with everyone involved in your child's education. In college, that is not the case. You cannot 
go to class with your child. You cannot call the instructor and ask why your student got a bad grade. You cannot show up at an instructor's house. Yeah, it's happened. You can't do that. So you can be the cheerleader and you can work with your advisor at the college and your counselor at the high school and we will all work together, but you gotta just take a step back and let your student be a college student. Because the bottom line there, FERPA. FERPA is fun to say, it also stands for the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. How many of you know what HIPAA is? Hands up, all right, the Healthcare Information Privacy Act, that protects your doctor from taking a picture of your weird rash and putting it on the website. FERPA protects your child. I don't care if your kid is 12 taking classes, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act protects their information. Unless they sign a piece of paper saying, we are allowed to talk to you, we cannot talk to you. No one at the college can talk to you unless we have that paper. So that's something that all the colleges cover to make sure we can communicate and be successful together. Benefits of participating. Students can earn college credit and credits at the same time. Get a head start on college. Experience college early to understand how much fun college is. Save tuition and textbooks. I don't know why that one isn't just like its own separate slide, but there are lots of benefits. I, I, I know this is a surprise again. The classes you take in college can be used to your high school graduation requirements. That's a huge benefit. So there are lots of benefits. There are consequences though. If students fail or withdraw from too late from college courses, the district may require students' families to repay the cost. So if you come in and get all A's, congratulations, we'll put you on lists and we will celebrate you. If you come and fail a whole bunch of classes, the next thing you will get is not necessarily a letter from us, it's gonna be a letter from your district saying you now need to pay us for those classes because we're not paying you to fail. Also, the grades the student earns are gonna be on your transcript permanently. So again, you can wreck your entire high school GPA by getting one bad grade in one college class. If students fail or withdraw often, future financial aid may also be impacted negatively. So again, there's a thing called completion rate. You have to meet it to be financial aid eligible. If you come and drop too many classes, the completion rate goes down and you may start off at your four year school years down the road financially aid, on financial aid probation. So there are impacts both now and later on down the road. Again, poor performance, you may be placed on probation or dismissal um, or academic probation or dismissal by the college. So there are a lot of bad ramifications there. So if your GPA drops below a 2.0, you are placed on college credit plus probation. This is a state rule. Um, or if you withdraw from two or more courses within the same term. You then can only take one college class and that college class cannot be the same class or in the same group of classes that you failed, got a D in, or withdrew from the last term. Um, so again, if you are a high school senior and you come in and you fail English in fall of your senior year and you're on probation, you don't get to take English in your spring term, so you may have to take summer school. You'll work with your counselor in your school district, but again, understand, if we perform poorly, there are ramifications. If you are on probation, you have a term in which you can bring your GPA above a 2.0. If you don't bring the GPA up above a 2.0, you are placed on CCP dismissal, which means you are kicked out for a term. At the end of the term, you appeal to the school district to see if you can be reinstated. It is not a promise, it's not a given. The school district can say no. So understand there is a chance that you can be bounced from free college classes if you do poorly. Uh, a student may appeal to their secondary school. Um, that's basically just the policy. Um, if you appeal to take the same class, the school can let you know. Within five days of being dismissed, you can appeal that. Um, every secondary school has a policy, so you will want to check with your counselor if you are doing poorly in classes. Expenses. For public colleges and university, there's no cost to the students or families for tuition, fees, or books lest you fail the class or something like that. Private colleges and universities, students may be charged a small cost per credit hour. Optional expenses are yours. So we do not provide transportation, so um, we also don't charge for parking, some schools might. So if there are extra classes above and beyond college coursework, your family may be responsible for that. 
Support services, high school counselors, again, the most important part of your young scholar's life is your high school counselor. They control whether your student graduates, they control whether they get into CCP, they control everything, so work with them. Advisors provide course selection assistance, we also work uh, for job planning and hooking you up with resources at the college. Um, we provide the same academic supports to College Credit Plus students on our campus that any other student would get. So, uh, tutoring, uh,